Mahale Indore, India, in association with International Simulation and Gaming Association, ISAGA. The Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming is established to promote simulation and gaming as pedagogy and undertake research in this multidisciplinary area of interest. I, Dr. Aditi Vaid, on behalf of Sri Vaishnav Vidya Peet Vishwadhyaya Fraternity, would heartily like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Vinod Dunleka, Founder and Director Mantis, New Delhi, India, uh, Dr. Jigyasu Dubey, sir, a coordinator for Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming, invited guest, eminent panel members, participants, and dear students. Today's webinar under the Pratiti is on the topic, Experiential Learning from Simulation and Games, and our resource person is Vinod, sir. So before starting, let me give the audience a brief introduction about our today's speaker. Dr. Vinod Tumlekar is the founder of Mantis, which has created and conducted simulation-based games and learning experiences since 2003 in business operations, business strategy, corporate strategy, marketing and brand management, entrepreneurship and project management for managers and postgraduate uh, management students. His strengths are in arithmetic and imperial research, learning behavior, applied psychology and quantum physics. So we welcome you, sir, and I hand over the session to you. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. I think it's faster that way. Correct. Do you want to go? Okay, sorry. Uh, I hope I'm audible and visible on the screen. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. Dubey, Dr. Dhar, and others at uh, Sri Vaishnav uh, Vidyapit, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, today, we are talking about uh, a topic that uh, probably concerns all of us, uh, teachers, trainers, uh, consultants in the academic space. Um, I'll move a little fast because I over exceeded my aspirations and I probably created 40, 50 slides and had difficulty in reducing them. So I'll try to speak and cover as much as possible. Uh, first of all, a quick uh, brief about me. I've been playing for almost 40, 50 years and uh, into games uh, for the last 25. Uh, Mantis.so is CO .in, is uh, the website for my firm called Mantis, where uh, we have been making games for the last uh, 20 years or more. Uh, we've made about 40, 45 games, about 30, 35 of them are dead, obsolete, um, too big, too thick, too complicated, and so on. Um, but it has been fun along the way, uh, in the sense that we have been able to look at uh, uh, many aspects about uh, games, that is, as you can see here, design, development, facilitation, research, including gamification and other assorted stuff like uh, game theory and war gaming and so on. I'll start with uh, a game for all of you. I think that's good. So my question to you is uh, here, uh, how do you play? The question for this game, I wish I had done it physically for all of you, was if I had a coin, and I toss it up 10 times, and listen to me carefully, if I had a coin and I toss it up 10 times, for the first time 10 times, first five times, it comes up heads. What do you think is going to be the result for the remaining five times? Come on, I'm sure you could uh, let me know very quickly, the answer is not too complicated. No calculus or trigonometry here. Quickly, let's see. Income tax department is going to knock on your door. <laughs> quickly, what is it going to be? Heads, tails, or is it going to fall on its side? Can be anything, any combination of head or tails. Only five more uh, times that I'm going to toss my coin. What is it going to be? Heads or tails or what? Could be any combination. Come on, we need to be able to predict. We are adults, we know the future. Come on. Quickly. Could be any combination. 
So but give me give me one combination. Five heads I've got in a row. What's the remaining most, five? Most likely five tails. Most likely five tails. Okay. Fine. We'll do one thing. We'll wait for other answers a little later. Maybe you could participate later and let me know how uh, you play the game. In the meantime, we'll go to other uh, simpler things like this. First, let's define simulation. And uh, I've combined a number of uh, uh, ideas into one single uh, statement here. Basically, it's a representation of something. It's a smaller form of something else. It's a caricature of something else. It may be real, it may be artificial, it may be imagined, it may be something in the future or the past. Um, and examples of simulations I've given you at the bottom of this uh, slide. The story, Indians know what is Panchasutra, of course. Uh, Eric and uh, JB, I'll tell them later what it is. Um, anything that you see on the stage, a stage or a role play, something that you see, your um, films on Netflix or um, Amazon and on the theater screen, uh, films and so on, a news report, a case study, a toy car is a simulation. And then I today I ventured a little further away and tried to add things that were probably not available as simulations, um, at least in our daily lives. A plagiarism is a simulation. If a student, or nowadays I think some faculty do that also with respect to research papers. So when you plagiarize some intent, that is a simulation. A ventriloquist is a vocal simulator, uh, which, uh, I mean, I was dreaming and I thought this was a good idea. A passport photo is a simulation, is a smaller size of you. Uh, and of course, if you take a photo of the Burj in um, um, the Middle East, the Burj Khalifa or whatever it was called, that photo, the small photo, is a simulation of something large and real. Here is a simulation. I suspect most of you are familiar with. This is uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling's uh, film. Um, and there are talking animals, of course. It's unreal, like any simulation ought to be. Um, and there is a story from the beginning to the end. It keeps you captivated. So there's mystery, there's imagination, and everything put together. Uh, it's not real. It's not intended to be. Maybe the real picture is much larger. And now we come to the second definition. I have four definitions in a row before I get to the heart of the uh, story. A game is basically an interaction between individuals or between organizations, between uh, uh, countries as well. Uh, well, a country is an organization. Uh, whereby I put voluntary and controlled in black because that is going to be debatable. debatable. Uh, um, rules that control what you're supposed to do. We are familiar with the games of cricket and football and chess and badminton and so on. So if you could look up on those as examples of what is, could be a game. But then game theory comes in and then we are supposed to look at everything else. How um, any two entities uh, interact. If A does B and B does that or something else in response, that becomes a part of uh, game theory. So we have stories like uh, the prisoner's dilemma and so on. But I got simpler expense, uh, examples at the bottom of this page, such as cricket and logo and PUBG. I'm sure probably everybody knows. Uh, we have SimCity, of course. And Mission US, I urge everybody to see that uh, simulation. It's not so much as a game. Uh, but there are options there which uh, take you into a mysterious world that make you enjoy it. Then you have Catan. Catan is a game that I have started in the last uh, two years or so. A Scrabble, of course, everybody's played. And you have uh, Rami with cards. Battleship, I played 50 years back, and I want to play it again with some of you whenever there is time. And of course, there are other uh, games down there which uh, apparently defy the, the uh, words in black at the top, voluntary and controlled simulations or controlled events. Uh, crimes, terrorists, pickpockets, politics, scams, these go beyond, but they are aspects of game theory, which we uh, fascinatedly study, and we're excited by what happens next. Here you see a board, it is a familiar Pachisi board, uh, Pachisi as in India, but uh, 
probably it gets called differently in different parts of India as well. I think it has a different name in different countries as well. Uh, so the game is of uh, chance. I put a couple of dice on the top left hand corner to show that this is a game of chance. So therefore you could divide a game into some stuff by way of chance, some of choice. And because we are talking about experiential learning, I thought we should understand what exactly is experience. So I looked up the dictionary and I had two um, easy definitions. A particular, something that you can identify, instance of personally encountering. I mean, you've got to be there. Uh, and either you are watching it or you're part of it. Either you're watching cricket or you're playing it. And second one is process or fact. This is a very serious uh, definition of, again, personal observation, encountering, or getting absorbed by it. I mean, probably you're being operated on for your uh, root canal or whatever. But I thought I'll put it simply, and I found a formula here. An experience is equal to sensation plus emotion plus memory. Now, that plus is not mathematical. It is probably some kind of multiplication or meshing all the three. So if you can sense something, that means you can see, you can feel, you can hear, etc., and you are affected by it. Uh, so therefore, there you have an emotion, and then you remember it because we are talking about the past. We are not talking only of something that happened now. I think you have an experience. I know this is again the definitions are always debatable, but they at least help us get to understand about eighty to ninety percent of the issue. Uh, examples are out there. What do you remember? You remember your breakfast? Yes. What you had this morning, maybe yesterday. It goes into the past, maybe last week or last month, you've forgotten. Accident, losses, achievements, win, uh, the IPL, uh, Netflix, whatever film that you saw yesterday. And of course, our memory is haunt us, memory is last for some time. So, whatever happened last week, you remember what happened last year or last month, you've forgotten. So something that hurts us very much, I think, is a better experience to remember than something that causes a lot of pleasure. And of course, the last word, error. Error is a good one because it will haunt us through every game that we play. And now we come to the last definition that we must clarify. Uh, again, I went to the books because books give you a very, um, a very thoughtful uh, description. So the act or process of acquiring knowledge or skill. Here, it refers only to the knowledge or skill. Second one is, um, is skewed towards knowledge, the knowledge acquired by systematic study. That means if you accidentally study or do something by accident and you learn, you're not likely to learn. That is, that is what uh, the dictionary said. Uh, somewhere, somebody talked about the change in behavior. So I thought I needed a definition for myself. So I caused, I decided that learning was something that I understood today more than before and possibly caused a change of behavior today. That means it may, may or may not cause a change of behavior, but if it did, it is a sign of learning. That means I have changed because I've learned something. And of course, in the HROB, learning and development field, we are uh, used to look at learning in at least four different areas in terms of knowledge, attitude, skill, and behavior. We need to go learning. We understand learning deeper. So I thought of bringing in Bloom and his uh, learning objectives. Why do we learn? So you can see that we learn because uh, uh, in school, we learn because we want to acquire that knowledge. So therefore, the uh, um, focus or the emphasis is on remembering. But in life, we need to understand more than just remember. We need to be able to see other examples and absorb it. We need to be able to apply that, whatever we learn. Otherwise, whatever we claim to have learned is of no use. Uh, and of course, as we add, we become wiser and smarter. We get to uh, analyze things that we get to see the similar things. And therefore, we get to evaluate them, compare them, and find out which one is better and why and more effective and so on. And of course, largely at the top is something to do with creation. In my uh, experiences or my how shall I, exposure, I thought I would add two more um, objectives to this. One, 
was that we should learn to solve problems. And the second one, an issue which will come up very soon in this particular presentation of mine, is we should learn to have fun. Okay, I think that's a little extreme, but I think we'll have fun later on. So therefore, what do the wise guys say about learning? They talk about it from different uh, viewpoints. And therefore, here you are. I put Einstein at the top because um, I think he has learned and understood more than more of many of us put together. Any fool can know. So learning knowledge is actually at the bottom of the pyramid. The point is to understand, that is how to compare it to other things, how what happened yesterday, how can we analyze it? How can you ask the why and find out the answers and so on? John Dewey, who said that we do not learn from experience, but you learn from reflecting on that. That means if, you, if something happened to you yesterday, and if we did not think about it the second and third time, I think that's wasted opportunity. Number three, we have Spencer. The great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. This has been at the bottom of my uh, all my emails for the last 15, 16 years. And that sense, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, tells you about my point of view about what learning could be. We must learn uh, so that we can act upon it. We can use that learning. Uh, we only think when confronted with a problem. And I think we also think when we have pain, adversity that pushes us to think deeper. Now, we have got a very strong basis now in terms of definitions and what uh, Bloom said. So we're going deeper into uh, Paul who defined what experience was uh, and how to learn from it. Of course, he was not the first person to talk about uh, experiential learning. Uh, Dewey had said it earlier, as I had shown it to you in the earlier page. So we are back to this one where he said that when you have an experience, uh, you could reflect on it, you could think about it, and then you could draw conclusions from there. So you have an abstract conceptualization. And now that you have a conclusion, or what academics like us call a theory, with that theory, we practice it. So therefore, we have active experimentation. The first thing you do, the first time you do with anything, it's an experiment because you don't know how it works. But, uh, irrespective of how much confidence you have, it's possible that fails. So you go in for a repetition of the experience. So therefore, you become uh, better at understanding what happened to you. So you have a better theory, you have a better concept, and then you apply it better. So you become smarter. So therefore, experience makes you think, you conclude, and that conclusion you, you use uh, to, well, solve problems. I have this in a different way. You just have a look at it. I put it up in uh, experience at the left. The first thing that happens, you reflect upon or think about it in a deeper form. Try to conclude from it. Uh, even if it is approximate, such as, for example, where I say abductive reasoning, uh, where you have been able to explain maybe 60-70% of what you've seen, you apply that. The first time you apply that, something goes wrong. Uh, but you look at the experience again, maybe you reflect upon it again, find mistakes. And then once you do that repeatedly, uh, repetition is important uh, for you to learn better. Uh, you uh, are able to learn from that experience. Ah, I have an experiential uh, illustration for you. Uh, look at me. I look up and I see clouds. And in India, it is summer. And right now in Delhi, it is about 32, 33, 35 because of the rain. Otherwise, we would have 40. If I look at this picture, I see cloud. But it's quite possible that after I see cloud, it rains once. And then maybe a second time, I see clouds again. And therefore, it rains again. And now I have a conclusion. That means I conclude that. Whenever there is a cloud, I can expect the rain. So if you see me with an umbrella, you can more or less conclude that I have had an experiential learning experience from watching clouds and rain and putting them together. But of course, this does not happen often. Because in summer, it does not rain. You might see clouds. So as time passes by, as I look up these clouds and the rain frequently, I may look at uh, a context to be able to explain what happened to me. But that's how, you, how I learned. What did I learn from uh, whatever research I've done across the last 20 years? So uh, 
learning of course we went sideways and uh, deep um, we did some a lot of research with uh, dr dar and dr dubey who are here listening as other panelists and some of the things that we in investigated with experiential learning in games uh, the games that i conducted are here we learned to understand what was uh, experimentation experimentation was a facet of the self efficacy of uh, game players uh, similarly exploration and innovation made them play better understand the game and therefore play better proactivity was a part of both self efficacy as also uh, interpersonal uh, competitiveness that is the competitiveness that you and i might have maybe in the same organization or when you're playing football or whatever it is uh measured aggression was also another facet of it in fact the most important uh, indicator of uh, competitors between two people uh we also looked at teamwork in across perhaps 18 20 different ways uh, including group thing and uh, social loafing and many other aspects in a different kind of a game uh, the game helped us understand collaboration very narrowly in the sense that we were very close to what happened we could see the participants and therefore we saw it differently from what might have been written in a textbook uh we also saw competitiveness in terms of data i'll show you some data a little later uh, as this presentation progresses uh, we had a game where uh, people created something like 80 100 uh, ideas um, and we had out of uh, say 60 70 participants present it was a collaborative idea generation exercise uh in one game we actually had uh people narrating and practicing business skills beginning from arithmetic skills to skills of uh, marketing advertisement and so on and understanding the accounting statements thereof um, um i will what i do is i will rush a little faster because it's possible that you might want to ask questions on these later uh in our most recent exercises uh, research we examined the implicit uh, uh, theory of intelligence which uh, um, i mean i thought intelligence was only one kind but there is another where i think i am intelligent and or maybe i think i am not so intelligent and therefore it directs me to think in a particular way similarly we our research went deeper into uh, the goal orientation where we try to understand uh, uh what kind of orientation uh, pushes us into which particular manner of thinking the mastery goal orientation made us think uh of the idea that i could constantly keep learning once i kept on looking at my uh, failures and the events that uh, appeared to me which is basically experience where the performance goal i did not do that performance goal was always comparing myself with others and i and i was somewhere i mean i either tried to be 100% or better than others or maybe 80% of the lot etc that means i held myself with respect to the general uh, group with which i was operating in now these are some of the things i think when if you could ask questions i could go later i'll go to the next slide in this stage uh you could learn a lot from simply doing and looking back upon what you did but most importantly i think repetition is a great form of learning especially when you want to skill yourself not kill skill uh skilling helps you look at your uh, movement if there is any um, motor skill involved in the sense that using your arms and moving about here and there you become better when you do it the third and the fifth and the uh, sixth and the eighth time um the learning curve hits you in a very uh, positive way you gain from the knowledge of your errors you become smoother and you think less and you are able to produce better output when you repeat so if you are going to construct games and from the games that i have always uh, played and conducted repetition was a very strong core because it helped uh, people to do something a second and the third and the fourth and the fifth time so that they become better at it uh if they had inhibitions these repetitions helped to remove their fears and their embarrassments and become more concrete and uh, courageous at whatever they were weak or scared about 
Now, this is the one that I said, learning by comparison. Now, this is one of the outputs of one of our uh, recent games. Um, it was a game of about 30 hours played across uh, two and a half, three months. There were 10 teams and um, it was a financial management simulation. As you can see, uh, Q here refers to the currency. Uh, the others are only numbers. For example, sales units are the numbers. In this case, the, the, the item that was being sold was a car. So therefore, sales units means number of cars sold. So you have the number of cars sold, most of them around 34, 35,000. We have revenues, the last three zeros being uh, omitted. So you've got 72 to 79, I think, uh, thousand, which is uh, 78, 79 million here, as you can see. Now, these are numbers. How did you reduce them? How did you look at, how did we uh, get to the, look at the vast bit of numbers? And how did you learn something for us? From now on, I'll go a little slow. I put this particular uh, slide at the top and then we presented this differently. Now, what you see at the top of the page is the same that was there in the previous slide here. At the bottom of the page, we started ranking the indicators that were there in the first column. For example, sales, uh, 35,975, that is team number one, had the highest sales, so therefore it was number one. Team number three had the lowest sales of 32,403, therefore it was team number 10. And of course, everybody else in between with respect to those indicators here. And then we tried to see whether we could uh, extract some information here that would help us understand uh, business decisions and business processes better. Now, let me improve this particular uh, page for you and highlight only the ones and the tens as examples. Please look at this page again, and there you are. Let's look at uh, the team number one. That is the second column. How do I explain the learning from this game? That is the experience here. They had now played for about 27 hours. Uh, what might be called nine stages, called nine quarters. Now, after nine quarters, uh, Four quarters would be a year, so that's two years, almost three years of uh, a simulated time. After 27 months, the team number one had the highest sales. You can see that on the left side in the second column. But when you look at the price of the car and the wealth, the wealth is, of course, a cumulative uh, profit of the tax. If you look at the wealth, it is in the 10th place, although it had the highest sales. Now, you can start asking why. Some of the answers are there, right there in that same column. One answer is glaring at us. Its price is in 10th position. At 2189, where you can see at the, at the uh, top half of the page, at the price of 2189, it had the lowest prices in the economy. Therefore, it had the highest sales, the lowest prices. Therefore, it did not have enough profit. Therefore, it had the lowest profits in the economy. Therefore, its wealth was 10. Because its prices were the lowest, it also had the highest market share. You can see at 10.37% in the first, in the second column. Now, you can look at similar numbers with respect to team number two as well, or team number three or four, where ones and tens can easily explain. Ones and tens are good because they're at extreme ends, and therefore they explain to you very quickly. For example, let's take team number four, and you go down that page and look at unused raw materials, which is one. If you look at the top half of the page, you see unused raw materials, 14. It is the only team that has unused raw materials. Other teams don't have that, with the exception of the 
uh, teams of uh, eight, nine, and ten, which have one, which is probably close to zero. So let's see what the behavior of unused raw material. What does it indicate? Well, it has the highest price per car in the economy. It has not managed its raw materials well. It is a sign of managerial uh, weakness, failure, bad management, whatever you'd like to call it. And then you look at the wealth. Its wealth is in ninth position. Its sales is in eighth position. Why? Because of its very high prices. And its very high, very high prices is indicative of not very good clarity in terms of decisions. And that decision, that example is also there in terms of unused raw material. Unsold cars, it is sixth amongst the 10 companies here. The cash balance is ninth. It has the lowest cash. So you can see a team number four as an example of poor decision making. And this is an experience that participants can extract and learn and take home uh, permanently, which is better than a textbook. We can do the same thing with other numbers, other teams as well. It is not necessary that you delve upon only one in 10, two and eight and nine, or three and eight and nine are also good enough for you. So one, two, three, uh, eight, nine, 10 are good uh, numbers to concentrate on. And when you compare them, you can extract a lot of information, things that you can confirm by reading uh, a textbook or listen, listening to your class teacher and so on. Another way of learning from uh, games is to look at your own learning or some performance indicator across a period of time. You could call it a KPI, like we saw sales in the previous page or revenues, etc. And you can to compare it over a period of time you know, find out how well you have been doing across the last uh, eight months or 10 months or 10 quarters or something like that. It also tells you when you can compare one line with another, that means one trend line with another, such as your prices, which are sales. It's quite possible that the price are going up and maybe the sales are coming down. So you could work from there, you could work backwards and come to conclusions, useful conclusions that you cannot do in a case study or reading a textbook. Games are fun. Principally because they allow you uh, to think uh, differently within the boundary of uh, rules as constraints. And every time you take a decision, it converts to action and therefore somebody reacts to you and therefore you get instant feedback. That instant feedback affects you strongly because you are there on the scene of uh, the experience and therefore you are likely to correct yourself immediately. That means your behavioral connection happens very quickly. That is why games are very quick modes of learning that is why games have to be introduced at academic centers and wherever the difficult concepts are there, I think they can be faster, learned faster by means of games. There you are. We are back to the concept of fun. I will leave this to you for a minute. I like to take a drink a little bit of water. Earlier, we looked at Bloom and his six objectives, starting from knowledge to all the way to creation. And I suggested there were two more uh, objectives of learning that we could pursue. One could be the pursuit of solution of problems. That means learning should be centered around solving problems as an objective. The second could be what Foster says. Why should we not learn? Because it is fun. 
and fun is in the discovery. And once you discover something, you go on to repeat it again and again willfully. Discovery comes from solving puzzles. Discovery come, comes because you say that I didn't know this before. It also comes from the idea that uh, it has been so easy to understand this. I didn't know why I didn't understand this before. So basically, learning therefore becomes uh, an exposure to something today which is much more than what it was yesterday. Learning therefore comes to fun as Costa says it. And fun is not merely uh, uh, a comedy act. It's the it's the sign of discovery. It is the final product of solving a puzzle, as he calls it. He says it's a drug, and I hope all of us get addicted to this drug. Look at this example. Actually, it was a huge hall. There were some 85, 90 students that day. This was last year. It was an induction program at some business school. At one corner. Uh, there were four or five, there are four in that particular seat. Now that girl is standing up and playing a game. Now she can always sit down, but she can't sit down because the excitement of discovery is too much. She has to stand and participate in the discussions. Sometimes the discussions are stressful. Fortunately here it is not visible. And unless, unless of course, uh, it is possibly in... Uh, the mind of that person on the left. But everybody is having fun. They're trying to discover something and learn something new. This is what games does. This is the ultimate objective of learning to produce fun and discovery. Uh, you cannot have learning most of the time unless you have somebody who can help you along the way by asking you the questions, uh, directing along. Uh, particular issues that you may not have seen and let's call him the facilitator in a game. He helps you conclude better. He helps you jump over your natural bias and beliefs. Uh, we are all human, of course. He helps you arrive at an honest conclusion. He helps you look at, uh, look at uh, different uh, alternatives to the problem that you had. Um, he helps you repeat and gets you to repeat a transaction so that you can understand better. He helps you reach a level of expertise uh, that you could not believe possible. Uh, he is the one that uh, uh, kills your fears merely through the act of repetition. Um, therefore, you become more optimistic, more open to learning. Uh, you become uh, open to uh, more difficult issues that you, you never thought possible. You are able to now uh, attempt to attack uh, difficult uh, teams in the game that you were uh, playing. Um, helps you conquer your more difficult uh, emotions. You therefore find that stress is momentary and it is possible that you can uh, attend to the problem with the same cool attitude as with stress as well. Um, and of course, uh, it is the facilitator who helps you realize what you're good at, what you're not, and how you can concentrate on weaknesses and become stronger. There are other game-based learning teams. I suspect uh, some of you are already um, aware about these things. I put them all together. Um, we often call gaming as the uh, idea behind making games, but it is actually limited to something uh, that you can make on the mobile or on the screen. Uh, it doesn't expand to everything else in games. Gamification uh, is sometimes thought about as making a game. It is not so. It is basically the act of using game-based elements in non-game scenarios like uh, well, people's behavior, for instance. Uh, Game theory is basically a study of uh, human <laughs> interactions and predictions and so on. <laughs> so we can bring in everything there. Uh, sociology, economics, politics, uh, terrorists, uh, um, 
conspiracy theories and whatever you can think of. Or you can try to find out how to maybe where can you have uh, the next hit by some um, criminals and so on. You can think everything, you can predict everything over there because that is a very deep uh, understanding of the behavior of people. Uh, games people play is a very small print book, but I like the um, better one, the I'm okay, you're okay, which helps you understand people from uh, the parent, adult, child uh, roles or perspectives that Thomas Harris, the uh, author, has written about. I like that immensely, so much so that I have four copies. I also have three or four copies of Art of War. Um, I also reviewed them once. It's wonderful that you, everybody needs to read it. It tells you how to prepare for the future, how to, but of course it was set in uh, 2003 and 2400 years back. So some of the things that he has predicted do not apply today. Uh, you will find a lot of uh, game theory, um, um, strategic issues, um, issues for the future, uh, and you'll find comparisons with uh, learning in the state strategy that Michael Porter spoke about. Um, I have a book on competition, Competition by Nelbuff and Vandenberg. I'm not able to read it. It's right there behind me. It's about 30, 40 years old. Uh, I wish I could read Arthasatha. Everybody knows Kautilya, the son of Chanak, also known as Chanakya, um, and how he out thinks. And I mean, I guess, uh, um, I think there are many other people like out there, like Ch uh, Kautilya. I can't uh, think of them outright. Uh, we have, um, and most of you probably remember uh, uh, the idea called Nudge, for which uh, Taylor got the Nobel Prize. And of course, there are different ways of people thinking and acting and behavior. And like I said, if our behavior changes, it's a sign of learning. And uh, these books, Blink, Thinking Fast and Slow, Art of Thinking Clearly, etc., help us understand thinking better. This is a quick view of uh, helping us understand how games can uh, produce learning or drive learning. Games or simulation games, we can have that as well. Uh, cause must have mystery, must have a challenge, must have a, a problem to attack, problem to solve. Something that uh, is matches the capabilities of the player is best. Uh, then he must be forced to uh, make errors. Uh, he must get second chance uh, uh, to repair himself. He must get uh, progress reports of how he is doing. Uh, if he can do that, I think he gets a chance to play again. And therefore, he becomes smarter. And of course, he changes as he understands what he did, why he did, and what happened whenever he did something. And therefore, the circle goes on again, and he's ready to play a game. And one of the key constraints of a game, a good game, is of course the player's engagement. And there you are. We are back to the game. What answers do we have? You, you, do you thought I would not? I would forget the game, did you? So the question again. I toss this ten times. For the first five times, first five times it comes up heads. What is going to be the result for the remaining five times? Quick. Come on, everybody. Come on, participate. What do you think is the answer? Come on, it's not that difficult. You don't have to read books. You don't have to Google for the answer. You can take out a coin and check it out if you want. Dr. Mandel, I know you have the answer. We know, sir, one answer in the chat box. Ah. Dr. Yeah, I, I think somebody can help read it out for me. Okay, so I will read out, sir, for you. Uh, it okay, is 50, 50. From... okay, Devi, yes, 50-50. Yes, okay, fine. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Uh, uh, Jaga, I can't hear you. You're on mute. No, no, I, 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 I'm thinking and I verbalize when I think. So I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure what. Okay. Can you repeat okay. your question or not? Okay. Take a coin and throw it 10 times. Or rather, I will do it. And the first five times, I get heads. 
What's going to happen to the remaining five? Don't cheat. Well, it, it, it could be it could be heads or be? tails. It, it still what has a 50 50 chance of it of either being heads or tails. Okay. Okay. What else? Because there's no guarantee the rest all will is going to be tails, you see. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Dubey. Would you like to venture something? Okay, I have the answers here with me. The answer is I don't know. I tell you what happens. Because we don't know, that is why a game is interesting. The game is interesting because of its mystery and because of its unexpected nature. If if if, if the end was expected, it would be a simulation. A game is where the end result we don't know. We don't know who will win the Wimbledon next time. Okay, so if you're in the stock market and if you're an optimistic kind of person, you will think that the next five times it will be heads only. You will think that the coin is anyway biased. Biased means what? It is weighted in some form. So you will think that it is always going to be heads. And you'll buy those stocks on the stock market. Not realizing that what goes up must come down, according to Newton. And Einstein also, I think. So therefore, uh, as they say in cricket, the glorious uncertainty of the game, every game is uncertain. The more uncertain it is, the more we like to play. That is why we would like to uh, gamble. Give me a pair of dice. Give anybody a pair of dice and put in some kind of a set of rules and constraints. Everybody's ready to go. Anyway, any quick comments? Okay, I'll, I'll maybe I'll wait for that in the next one. So therefore, remember, the question I asked you the first was, how do you play? But this time I'm asking, how do you learn? So the question is, uh, we play and we learn depending on who we are. And because the game is so uncertain, uncertain, that is why we love playing games again and again and again. Experiential learning is, of course, enlightening. That means it, it affects us by its uh, surprise element, the discovery factor. It is fun, not because Costa says so. Because we have all experienced fun games when we played games. It's unforgettable, including the games that you have lost. It's addictive because you want to go there and play a game. I've played Katan just about 10 times. I don't have anybody else to play with. Otherwise, I would have played 11th and 12th again and again. It takes about two and a half hours to play. In my school days, I've played cards and carom and uh, cricket and all that. Hours and days on end. And of course, high ROI. Not high, highest ROI of any uh, academic effort you can think of, and probably the cheapest. Thank you all for listening to me. I hope I can answer your questions. Thank you so much, sir. So now I would like to request our participants if they have any question for the speaker. You can also post in the chat box. I would read out for you. Uh, for participant, it is in Aditi, QA box. Aditi, ma'am. Sorry, QA. Can you Aditi, ma'am? Yes, uh, Vishwam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, what is the importance of simulation training in HR? If, you, if we specifically talk about HR, then uh, what is the importance of simulation training in HR, sir? Well, for the student, he is likely to understand lots of things at the same time in a very short time. Most games are interdisciplinary in the sense that you learn this and that and the other 
and lots of things that don't have labels also. We played a financial management simulation, which number they just gave you. There we learned marketing, we learned teamwork, we learned how to forecast and all that. Uh, so you, you intrude into other topics and you learn them very easily. You learn them surreptitiously. You don't realize you're learning. Now, if you can learn so many things at the same time, you need training, not mainly in HR, in other places as well. It cuts down your uh, time to learn, time to understand. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you, Anand. I will not. Can I ask? A, can I make a comment quickly? Yes. I, first of all, what an amazing presentation, Vinod. Thank you so much. Made me think so much. You know, one of the thoughts, yeah, one of the thoughts that actually came to mind was sort of the heritage and, and history in India itself. If you think of the Mahabharata and how, you know, that the learning that happened over there between Arjun and Krishna and, and how those sorts of messages sort of sort of laid the foundations, you know, of what we're trying to do over here. So the question I, I had, I've always struggled between the difference between intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. I think I can understand a little bit between knowledge and wisdom, but how do you see those three sitting, you know, the, in, in this context? What's the difference between intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom? And I think knowledge is something that you is contained by the books, and uh, I think it's limited uh, by the person who knows it, or the books, or the libraries, or all the depositories you can think of online and so on. Uh, wisdom, I think, is very, very personal. Uh, it's something that you know, which other people don't know. It's something that has come to you out of deliberate and long thought. Deliberate and long. Uh, I hear a lot of stuff nowadays about a word called overthinking. Overthinking is a blessing. Overthinking is what we need. Overthinking is what everybody needs to become wise. Intelligence is the ability to do something, ability to remember, ability to solve a problem. It's an ability. Right. Excellent. Th thanks, Vinod. I'll, I'll hold off any more questions for now. Thanks, Abhi. Uh, sir, sir, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the question is not directly related to the application of gaming, but it's a very general question. Like um, uh, sometimes we have seen that student uh, uh, lost their interest in gaming. So what measures can be taken to enhance their motivation or we can say interest of participants during gaming? So, uh, one is try to find out what games he plays. Okay. The second is to get him to uh, explain to you, ask him to explain to you how to play that game. The third is whether he can ex expand that particular game uh, a little more, maybe to other uh, colleagues and so on. At this stage, maybe or between the second and third stage, you can start talking about the issues in which he is not interested. Now, it is possible that it will work. It will also be uh, possible that it may not work at all. For example, many of us don't like arithmetic and math and so on. So just because I play your game and you play my game doesn't mean that I'm going to play, I'm going to like maths if I don't like it in the first place. It will take time. Some of the uh, reasons for our fear or embarrassment or lack of interest in something has deep roots, 20 years, 30 years back, etc. Sometimes it is because we are not in that peer group. Maybe if you shift that boy to a peer group who are doing the same thing, that thing which he is not doing now, that thing which he is afraid of doing now, that thing which he does not like to do now, he will do it. He will get uh, exposed to it. That means if he is, a, a, let's say, a person who does not like to exercise, you put him in a group of people who are always exercising, I'm sure that habit will rub off on him. If you generally a person who does not read, you put him amongst a, a group of students who are voracious readers, I think you will change. And my think is about 80-90%, I am confident that to have worked. Change his group of friends, put him in a different group of uh, uh, 
people who are a certain kind of passionate kind of a thing because his repeat and of course the third is to do with repetition if we get him to do repeat something something small not big i think at the fourth or the fifth attempt he's going to like it <laughs> yes yes thanks thank you so much We know very quickly one one additional question if it's okay, yeah. Sure, Jimmy. Yeah, so I I think you you're touching on some very fundamental aspects over there, and the I just wanted to get your thoughts on the importance of the suitability of the model of a or a simulation that uses models for the desired outcome, and how the role of the facilitator that you touched on is almost fundamental, right, to ensure that 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 outcome is what we want and we don't get negative outcomes, you know, where, where we don't have the right model or, or it gets misused. Uh, so a classic example that from personal experiences, you know, in flight simulators, we used to teach pilots how to fly. And if the, if the simulation is not of a high fidelity, what happens is the pilot starts to understand how they can trick the instructor into believing that they have done the right thing. And then you find out when they crash the aircraft that, it, that it, what we taught them was the wrong thing. So I just wanted to you know the thoughts on you know the importance of the suitability of the model and the key role of the facilitator in ensuring the right outcomes. The problem is probably a little uh, in a different place. It is that of the learner. Right. If he does not want to learn, the best simulation experience or the best facilitator cannot do anything. I have had very uh, uh, expert very nice, informed, nice participants who became friends later, who did not participate in the game that we played. They would not do it. Some of them actually folded their hands and sat like that. They would not do that. Embarrassing me because they were adults. I mean, I can go and talk to a student and say, why are you not doing this? I will punish you, I can tell him, but I can't do that when adults. So, if the student does not like it, there's no way. And maybe sometimes in a simulation, it is possible that he may like to know what he's going to learn. In a game, I suspect we may need to keep the objective a little uh, mysterious. Yeah. Let him discover the game elements on his own. That will be a challenge and that will be a very pleasant challenge for him. So, maybe to get him interested is uh, uh, Maybe you can make the simulation also mysterious. Thanks, you know the, the, the engagement factor is fundamental, is what you're saying, right? You have to get the, the engagement person engaged. factor, but the engagement factor is uh, centered in the student or the learner. Yes, it is not in the facilitator. Maybe twenty percent or so, eighty percent of some. Thanks, Vinod. Thanks, Jimmy. So there are two questions in the QA also. Uh, Okay. I will read out for you. Uh, sure. RS. So, I am just curious to know how do you see the aspect of addiction with respect to games or gaming? Uh, <laughs> depends on what you're addicted to. I used to be addicted to uh, Sudoku quite some time. I used to spend 40 45 minutes a day. Then I said, nothing, no, I have to stop it somewhere because I can invest it somewhere. I stopped. Now, Sudoku, is that, a, is that poisonous? Well, if I spend 45 minutes a day, it's poisonous. And then I said, I said, I do that only when I'm waiting for something, maybe a train or a flight or something. So there I could do it. But then I said that sometimes that is to extend myself. But uh, addiction, maybe you can ask the student or somebody who's learning or playing it, you can ask him, what do you learn from this? And maybe something useful you can extract from there. Addiction is good. Overthinking is a form of addiction. Or maybe addiction is a form of overthinking. I don't know which. Einstein said that he thought about things more than anybody else. In his world, there was no experimentation. The only thing he had to do was overthinking at an addictive level. So it's not exactly at all addictions are bad instantly. Addiction, addiction to addiction to games, that's very, very good. 
I am biased, of course. This is my question. Very simple and basic, yeah. fundamental. Yeah. Are games for learning different from games for entertainment or competitions? Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Games for learning, you need to help the person understand. The objective of games for learning is to help people understand something for which the game has been written. Uh, it may not be a strict syllabus. But somewhere there, we have written that this is what he must do because he must learn all these things. Whereas the games of entertainment or games of pleasure or games of leisure, you can look at all those things. Sudoku, for instance, or Scrabble, or Ludo, or PUBG, they are all for relaxation. You do not need a facilitator or a teacher but to be able to stand by and say, this is what you should learn or this is what you learned. That uh, intervention is not necessary. So you uh, probably put in a lot more effort in games of learning than in games of pleasure. For games of pleasure, the player will play on his own. You don't have to uh, arrange something for him. He will go and watch his cricket match. He will play his uh, tennis, etc. You don't need to arrange something for him. So we can use this cricket or football as learning for learning. No, that's a different question entirely. You can. There is strategy, there is motor skills. Uh, what else? There is teamwork, there is collaboration, there is competition. There are a whole lot of things we need to be able to learn from the games that we call, which we don't use today. Okay. There are a lot you. of emotions out there. You can learn about resilience and pressure in, uh, in games like cricket and uh, tennis, for instance. Look at chess. I wish you could encourage our uh, five-year-olds and six-year-olds to play chess more often. Uh, Dr. Ravina, I have a question here, Jega here. Yeah. Okay, just, uh, I'm just curious about this thing about, um, about the use of simulation for, not for learning, but for discovery. I'm talking about experimenting policy, policy change and all, and we use uh, simulations for that. It's just that sometimes the, the fidelity levels are so high. Uh, do, do we risk losing the engagement? Because one thing about games, uh, low fidelity games is that it, it creates the, the engagement and, um, and, uh, and, and therefore, uh, in terms of learning, we can always create... Um, uh, connections and and describe from the perspective of what experience they had. But when it comes to high fidelity, like for example, like uh, um, if you are going to make a policy policy decision and we we are simulating that in a lab thing, how do we ensure that the engagement part? Or is there any risk engagement? You can lose engagement if it becomes too high fidelity. Um, I'm just curious about that. We have not had an experience in that area. I suspect fidelity is probably more of a function of age than uh, anything else. For example, let me explain. I think the young children like a game in fairy tales, Jungle Book, for instance. Uh, but you and I would not dare play a game with uh, Jungle Book. Youngsters can play Ludo for a long time. You and I would not because it's we don't have a choice. And I don't want to play a game where I don't have a choice. And I don't want to play a game where it's very abstract. Because I'm going to ask a question at my age. What's it there for me? Why should I learn this? Where can I apply this? Where's the context? So therefore, I want a high fidelity game. But that is because I'm an adult. A child, a high fidelity game, uh, if you give it to him, you'll have to give him a lot more detail. Fidelity comes with a lot of detail. Otherwise, the fidelity aspect does not work. If you want to teach somebody driving, a child, for instance, a toy car is enough. It does not need to have all the essentials of a real car. But that does not mean engagement is lost. <coughs> a child is as fascinated with a toy car as an adult with a real car. And if you reverse the two, you would have problems. The adult will require data. He will get excited with uh, a lot of data. 
and that is where the engagement and reality comes in. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. If you have older people, give them something real. Because for them to immerse themselves in something artificial will take time. And some of them will rebel. I had two 73-year-olds playing my game many years back. One came in the afternoon and stopped the game for two hours. He said, what is this game? What are you playing? It was about a year or two years later, I realized that it was because of his age. The other 73-year-old on the continent came to me and don't stop what you're doing. Don't listen to him. And both of them were sitting next to each other. And this is real. So the older people, they want to know what should I do with the artificial information you gave me? I don't want that. Tell me what is real. How can I do, etc. But in a real game, a high fidelity game, you may find it difficult to change the context. If you change the context, it's easiest to be real. See, in case studies and in, uh, in classroom environment, I mean, all of us, I think, are in higher education. In classroom environment, if you give uh, case studies, uh, do not give case studies by giving A and B and X and Y and all, or P, Q, R and all that. Give them real names. Give them data which sound real. Such as in 1969, this happened, and um, 2011, this happened, etc. And create the story with data. Then the adult student will respond to it better. That's the fidelity part. So you can have a real artificial game or artificial scenario with data constructed. Jungle Book has a lot of data built in, and yet it is not real. The difference is in the volume of data you give them. That's all. Probably that's the divider line. Dr. Dubey, you have, I think, three, four questions. Probably you could just read out and let me know. <laughs> In QA, we have three, four questions. So, uh, is from Ahinsa Aho. So, my question What type of games are good for exercising our brain? And I will go to little advanced for, for we are from making real life simulation like the one we are. Thing in enemy like sword art online. Uh, look at that question again. Basically, what type of games are good for exercising our brain? Okay, I'll take the first question. I think anything that uh, appeals to you, that will be fine. Take the one that appeals to you, that's important. Appeal means in terms of what you can actually solve. For example, I started with level one Sudoku. Then I realized level two is good. Level two is better. Then I looked at more complex versions of Sudoku. I tried the nine by nine from nine by nine. I tried 16 by 16, which was difficult. I tried numbers and letters. If you take on that, you uh, want to. That means the choice is yours. And I would advise everybody who don't play games, please play one hour of Sudoku every day. My prescription of the doctor. Or if you have a partner to play with, maybe you could try Scrabble or Katan. Katan is good. Katan is complicated. So an adult would like it. A child may not. I'm not sure. Some people have used Katan in, 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 in uh, college courses, overseas. And another question is from Dr. Smita. What yeah. important points should be considered by teacher while conducting simulation exercises? Uh, if you're doing it for the first time, 
you have some other person with you who has done the game or the exercise earlier. Or you go with him, be with him when he runs his simulation so that you see how it is done. Do not do it alone. I guess that should be enough for you. Yes. <laughs> And one question, last question is, it is necessary to explain the concept in advance and conduct games and simulation? Not for a game. The essential part of a game is mystery. To tell them what the rules. What ends happens in the end is of uh, no use. Even if you are simulation, for example, you would like to tell somebody about the story about uh, what JB said, Mahabharata. Why do you want to tell what, how the story ended right now? Let them find out. Everybody likes a mystery. We want to know who won at the end, what happened next. So don't tell in advance. Yes, if it's a college course, give them the syllabus in advance at the beginning of the year. But not in a simulation or a game. You can give them broadly and say, this is what we intend to play with this. This game is about uh, coming together. You say, don't say teamwork and other stuff. Just like coming together or being together, very broad. And at the end of the program, you can ask them, what did you learn? Don't say you should have learned teamwork by this time. That's wrong. Maybe you're smiling. I'm enjoying the I'm enjoying your lecture there. You know, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your enriching session as well as so many Q and A has been happening. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we can come to the end of the webinar now. Yes, sir. Thank you. So as we uh, reach the end, I request uh, Dr. Jigyasu Dubey, sir, Coordinator, Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming, to propose word of thanks. Uh, before that, my word of thanks. It's been a nice uh, time for me to hear. Uh, Devi, Jaga, and others here for their questions, especially. Uh, they help me think better and think deeper. I mean, I know it this much, but when you ask a question, I push and go forward, go beyond. And uh, maybe that's an example of how wisdom is created. Um, thank you for your probing questions. Other people also asked a very narrow question. I hope I have answered them um, correctly, and I hope. I hope all of you play more games. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, so at the outset, our most sincere thanks to Dr. Vinod Damlekar, sir, founder and director Mantis India, for accepting our invitation. You accepted, sir, our invitation on very short notice. I am thankful to you. And sir, you are the man behind this webinar series when university started it in the year 2020. And you helped us a lot. So we are thankful to you. In this webinar, you explained simulation and gaming in a very simple way. Thanks for such a knowledge enriching session. Vinodji, this webinar is also an experiential learning for us. Thank you very much. We are also thankful to the International Simulation and Gaming Association, ISAGA, for the collaboration and support in the organization of Pratiti 2023 Becoming Aware webinar series. We express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Upinder Dhar, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor of SWV, and Dr. Santosh Dhar, Rector and Dean of Shivashna Vidyapit Vishwavidyala Indore, for their guidance and motivation. Our sincere thanks to the today's panelists, Mr. Eric, Mr. Jawar Ballaji, Mr. Jegati Swaram, Jega, and Dr. Ramesh Sharma ji, and all other panelists present, and all the participants who make this webinar successful. I am also thankful to the host, Dr. Aditi Veda, Dr. Rupali Bharti, Madam, and all the members of the COESG and IT team of the university for their kind support. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next webinar uh, we announce soon for the next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I request you, all the participants to please thank fill in the Dr. feedback mentioned. Yes, sir. Sorry. No, I just want please. to say thank you. Dr. Sharma, because he has been a vocal, a very, very strong uh, supporter of uh, our ISAGA from many old days. 
and all through this, I mean, he and I have been in, um, engaged in a lot of uh, other learning sessions and other uh, platforms as well. Good to see you, sir. And Eric, I do not know why he's been very quiet. I wish he had, we had heard him more often. Uh, I'm missing many other big names as well. Toshiko, Elizabeth, I wish they had been here. Probably next time. Dr. Veda, sorry I interrupted you. Thank you. Please thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So at the end, I request all the participants to please fill in the feedback mentioned in the chat box to get your e-certificates. We'll be soon meeting with the next webinar. Thank you. Happy learning, everyone. Thank you, Vinodji. Thank you, Jagan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dubai Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Jaybi, good to see you. Jaga, good to see you as well. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.